Hi, and welcome! Today I will show you how I made this set of props for my space game. I'm going for a fairly grounded setting, with realistic graphics and believable technology. I will use Blender to model the assets and texture them in Substance Painter, and then import them into Godot, but the process will be similar for other engines as well. This is not really a tutorial, but more of a talking through of my process, and especially why I make the decisions that I make when designing. Still, there are some technical things I will talk about. I'll try to point out any pitfalls that you might stumble into, and hopefully you can learn something from my workflow. Or if not, then at least find some enjoyment or relaxation. And with that out of the way, let's start with the first prop. It's this sci-fi inspired cargo crate that is used in interstellar shipping. First, I made some 3D sketches to explore ideas I had for crates and to find a shape that I like. I had a design in mind that is made up of cubes in a grid, kind of for a flexible size. And I then beveled the edges to get a more interesting silhouette and some nicer interplay with light in the engine for the finished asset. And so more angled and rounded surfaces give the light more opportunities to create some nice effects and I want to enable that as much as possible in the assets I make. I push the extrusions further out until I got negative space at the edges, so get some convex and concave parts. And for the actual mesh, I started modeling by setting up the main mesh object in Blender as symmetry and X and Y, that will save me a lot of time in modeling things. And since it is a box to be used in space travel, I thought it should have some kind of thermal insulation, so the contents don't freeze during travel. And those extrusions, they can make some space that has insulation in it. So the cargo capacity is still like a nice even box on the inside with the insulation on the outside. I tried a few different variations of that look that I wanted. And I ended up liking this one the best. To me it has the nicest proportions of those sketches. At this point I considered how and where this box would then physically open. And wherever possible I want to make assets that can be used in multiple different ways to get as much out of the work I put in as possible. Uh, so the crate should have an open and a closed variant, and both of which will use the same model and texture set, so that makes my life a bit easier. So the inside and outside of the box will be on the same sheet, texture sheet. And with that in mind, I decided on a removable lid that is not attached to the main body, with some hinges or something. And this gives me more flexibility with how to use the asset later, and I don't need to pay attention to any rotation pivots or these kind of things. And you can see how this helps me later when I assemble the crates in Godot. I will get some more variation. And to emphasize the split between the two halves, I bevel that edge specifically quite strongly in Blender. So it will read even from some distance. And this is also helpful for the generators I will create in Substance Painter. I'll bit more on that later. Then I wanted to add a locking mechanism as well. Uh, that can give some variety for the texturing and give the box a different look from each angle you look at it. Like one side would be more flat and the other side would have more of these kind of details in it. I believe adding little bits of shiny or metallic elements can greatly improve the look of a like, somewhat simple prop. Adding some contrast in color can also work for this to break up the surface. And I actually thought about this lock quite a bit because I want to generate some design language in that that I can reuse. So the details have a design language that I can reference in the other crates I will later make as well. In my game, the props I make in this video, so those crates, are used by a corporation for shipping cargo and supplies uh, through space for interstellar shipping. So they should all look like they came from the same factory with the same design team and have this coherent uh, language to them. So now I'm moving on to the interior of the box including that transition area, the rim area, where the top and bottom half meet. And I'm also trying to make it easier for myself when texturing the prop later. So wherever the materials will change, I'm trying to add a little recess that will hide the edge in the finished materials and allow for adding some procedural grime and wear like to further hide it. And at the same time, I also add those slots on the, on the edges where I imagine some kind of locking mechanism will latch some uh, hooks or something that can receive like some very nice grungy weathering later. So the surface corner detail is there for the same reason on the outside of the box. I can add some label later to make it look more detailed than it actually is. 
and, and real. And those corners will catch a lot of nice dirt and wear and tear through those generators because there's like something for the procedurals to grab onto. If it's just a flat area, there's, there's nothing it can like catch. And about at this point, I should have added some carrying handles to the box, but I totally forgot until much later. And then it would have been quite a bit of a pain to change those meshes again. And so uh, this was a bit of an issue. At first, uh, it was quite disheartening. Uh, after I had spent all this time like, to make it this far. Uh, but then I thought that having a flaw in my designs actually kind of makes them more human and realistic. In reality, maybe this is the kind of box that everyone at the company complains about because of the pain to carry around, but they already produced a whole lot of them, so now the workers just kind of have to deal with it. Maybe beat them around a bit more than normal. And this also allows for some subtle storytelling. So if I decide to make a version with a handle included later, I can give that one to like the higher ranking units, the more elite groups in the base, and the less well-funded parts would have to deal with this less convenient boxes. And this would tell the story of some like inequality without the need for any words. But of course that would mean I need to rework this box anyways, and now I told you about it, so... Um... At this point, uh, I started to work on the low-poly version of the box, and while making the raw meshes, it helps to keep the originals without any bevel modifiers or the likes and then you can just work backwards from from your high poly to get to your low poly version by just removing the modifiers and then simplifying some shapes a bit and then of course i close up all the small recesses those openings uh, those will show up very nicely in the baked normal maps and don't influence the silhouette very much so they don't need to have tries for them and need to have actual geometry and the curved areas are a bit more tricky I'm actually not quite sure if this is the absolute most ideal way to do it. Reducing a cylinder to have less polygons and then baking normals for it will cause some weird stuff to happen, especially at the corners. I'll try to look for that later in the texturing stage. And for round objects in general, I reduce my meshes down to 8 faces on the parameter. This is generally enough to hold the shape, and in my opinion it looks more symmetrical than just 6 faces. And of course, there's a significant difference between the 8-sided low poly and the like, well, just a 32-sided high poly version. And when I bake the map, you can see that at the corners. There's some of the flat area behind that gets baked onto the extrusion where the corner kind of sticks out. I try to look for that in the painter file, you can see it. And, but this doesn't bother me that much. Like in the game, it's almost unnoticeable and it's like, kind of small anyways. And unless someone can suggest a better way to do it, this seems good enough for me. So with the low poly version completed, the next thing to do is creating a UV map for the mesh, for the low poly version. Because I expect the top and bottom of the crate to generally show up in the same areas, and most likely always together, I will UV them at the same time and sharing the same texture space. And for this first box, I keep all my UVs with their correct proportions. So I'm mostly dealing with rectangles anyways. So if it's uh, these kind of angled shapes, I could turn them into a rectangle on my texture sheet, but I'm keeping them in the original shape, in the original, with the original angles. And those extruded cube faces, they need four cuts, and then they can be extruded to a, almost like a square, some with the corners missing. So I could fill those, just stretch the UVs a bit, but here I don't do that. I do it later in some other uh, crates. So if I did it again, I might then manually change the UVs to connect the edges and like eliminate those gaps, the gap space between them, to get a little more texture resolution. Uh, since I'm using almost exclusively triplanar map textures for texturing in Painter, uh, that shouldn't be much of an issue, this kind of distortion. And after all the faces have a clean unwrap without any distortion, it's time to pack the textures on my UV sheet. So you could use auto-packing to do this, most software has this, uh, Blender as well. But generally, I prefer to have a bit more control and to do it by hand. And especially for assets like these, which will be used a lot, and I will get a lot of mileage out of the work that I put in here. For the packing, I start by splitting the UVs by component. So I can focus on placing the most important or largest unwraps first. So I split to the inside and outside of the box and the lock mechanism, this kind of thing. And this also lets me see which parts are very unwieldy and where I can cheat a bit to save a lot of space. So in this case, for example, I scale down the interior islands 
so the UVs for the interior parts of the box, to fit within the islands of that box's rim, the edge. This reduces the texture density for those areas quite a bit, but because they are less visible, it doesn't matter that much and it allows me to give more density to those external areas that will be seen a lot. And it lets the UVs, it allows for the UVs to be much nicer, much neater packed. And I also make sure to leave a gap between all the UV islands. This prevents some baking artifacts to happen, which you will see later with a different box where I make some small mistake. I'll point it out then. And also it helps for low resolution textures, uh, which would also be used for light mapping. Because if they are too close, then those pixels will bleed over and you will get some light where it shouldn't be and so on. And another thing which I try to do is to make the UVs aligned with the axis at which they will be seen later. So for example, the lock dials have details at a 45 degree angle. So I try to rotate the UVs uh, of the faceplate that will have this detail to match that. So when the final texture has a low resolution, that change in material will be less noisy and look cleaner because we're not fighting the pixel grid, but we're actually aligned with it. So it will look better. I'm also making those parts where I expect some text or painted details to have a much higher density, much higher, much, much higher texture density, because a low texture resolution usually shows in those kind of areas at first, because it's very recognizable if there's some, some text on it and it's low resolution. And then to finish off, it's very important in your 3D software to have a triangulate modifier on your low poly version which you definitely need to apply when exporting. And that is because under the hood, all 3D software works with triangles, not quads or polygons. And different software packages, however, use different algorithms to turn some polygons or n-gons into triangles. So if you have a file that you export in Blender and then use it in another software, if you want to bake your normals for some low poly quad mesh in Painter, for example, and then you import that same quad mesh, so not triangle, but the quad version, low poly into some game engine, and then if the engine decides to split the polygons in a different way than Painter, then suddenly your normal map will break because those polygons are not mapped to the same thing anymore. So just add a triangulate modifier uh, when exporting, and that will prevent that from happening. For the export itself, I place my object at the scene origin and make sure that the high poly and the low poly have the same origin and they're uh, overlapping of course perfectly and then I name them properly I apply all transforms so scale rotation and if you mess up here uh, it will pretty immediately be visible when trying to bake the textures in painter so double check this part if you have any issues there uh, for this one I also then thought that the high poly could use a small bevel at everywhere which will show up nicely in the normal map so I added that here uh, but in general be very careful of making any modifications to the meshes after finishing the low poly and UV unwrap and make sure that your meshes still match after any changes you make so in this case I'm only working on the high poly and it's a very minuscule change so it should be fine but you definitely don't want to do any larger geometric changes in both because if you have an unwrapped mesh and you modify it, then those UVs will get pretty warped and it might not turn out that well. So then I will export two versions uh, of the low poly and one of the high poly. And the first set is in OBJ for baking and texturing and painter. And then the second set of only the low poly is in the GTFL for using Godot. And you can use OBJ or FBX here. It doesn't really matter, but generally for Godot, uh, GTFL works quite well, so I use that. And my settings for this are based on my experience and mostly personal preference. So I don't need any material information for these ones here because they will be textured in Painter. Uh, and I also want all modifiers applied, applied to give a clean file that I can work and then works on its own without any material files or the like. So now I switch to Substance Painter and I start by setting up my scene. I change a few settings here that you can copy if you want, but most of it is just personal preference. So you can just pick whatever you're comfortable with. 
The important part for making assets to be used in, in Godot and probably most other game engines is to change the normal map baking mode to OpenGL because otherwise it will look very strange in the engine because it's the wrong way around, the normals are flipped. You can also see me add an emission channel here in the custom channels. I add it because I use emissive materials in Godot sometimes and for this project I end up not needing it but uh, yeah, it's just a habit of mine to set it up. And the other relevant part are settings for baking the maps. And here, uh, first thing we do is to set up the high poly mesh and then optionally a cage mesh for baking the normals. I'll not use one on this prop, but later for other props I will use cages and I'll show you how to do it then. And then I like to add some anti-aliasing to the baked maps, usually 4x4. And I crank the secondary rays to maximum for all map bakes. And because you don't need to do anything but wait for this and you get much nicer baked textures and I really don't see any downside to it because all the other material textures later are based on your baked maps so I want them to be as high quality as possible. And I also reduce the max occluder distance a bit to a quarter here. It's optional but I feel it makes the AO map a bit more useful because it is less uh, wide, less kind of big, less intense. And then after setting all those settings, I make a first test bake, a uh, low resolution, like 256 pixels. And if you don't do a bake here, but instead hit cancel, then all your settings will reset, at least in the version I'm using. Maybe they change them by now. So do do a test bake. After the bake, uh, well, it doesn't look quite right. So I go back and double check the low and high res I exported. By, I do it usually by importing them into a fresh Blender file. And I do that instead of checking in the original file uh, as a bit of a sanity check to see the actual data that I exported, not just the mesh that I thought I had exported. I like to be in control and double check everything, if you can't tell already, because um, this usually prevents some bad surprises. For this case, in the end, it was uh, the issue was that my UVs stuck out a bit at the top. I hadn't noticed that when uh, packing them. So they're wrapped around and the top part was baking over the bottom part and that's why it had that weird overlap in the, in the file. Uh, ideally, you would repack them here so they have no overlap, but I didn't really want to spend that time so my easy fix was just scale them down along the y-axis until they fit. It's a bit of a hack because the proportions get distorted like a tiny bit. It doesn't really matter for this asset and also the workflow, because I'm, like I said earlier, I use mostly triplanar mapping. And so now with the updated low poly version, uh, the bake looks good to me, at least at this resolution. So my final baking resolution in Painter is generally 4K for me, even if my assets will only get 1 or 2K maps, or even lower sometimes. Uh, the generators and substance I found work better with high resolution maps. I don't do it here, but generally I would recommend to bake only the normal map at 4K at first as another test. Uh, because just baking the normals is very fast, even at 4K. And you can spot errors that you might have missed in the low res test. So I will do it later for another prop and show you a kind of issue you can find in this that doesn't show up at a lower resolution. So anyways, off to bake some 4K textures and baking that resolution and with those rays can take quite a while uh, so try and time it a bit to get more out of your time like try and do something else in the meantime okay after quite some time later we can finally get to my favorite part which is texturing the asset of course we need id masks for all the different materials that we will end up using and since i didn't create those in blender and bake them out there i will make them in painter by hand so i use the polygon or island fill tools in the texture editors. They're very helpful for this, but for some of the smaller details we have to do it by hand with a simple paintbrush. And personally I find this very relaxing, but I can understand if people don't like it very much. Either way, there's not much way around it. So after a few minutes I have the four materials I will end up using blocked in. We have the main crate exterior, the shell, and the cushioned interior those bare metal parts and the painted metal that's used in the locking mechanism. Uh, next, let's set up some base materials for each 
uh, area for each part and then get to detailing. And so generally for every material I start in the same way. Uh, first uh, base material that absolutely just fills it and defines the properties very roughly. And then a new fill layer with a slightly different color and roughness and blend those using a grunge map to get some basic breakup in the material. And after that, some bump breakup in three steps. So a very large scale one, usually just like a Perlin noise. Then a smaller scale one that defines the surface finish. Uh, here I use a small bumpy one. It makes it look like something powder coated or something similar. And at last I add a mid-scale height breakup. I usually do the mid-scale one last because the other two, especially like the small scale one, really define the material, like how it will look in the end. Whereas the mid-scale one is basically just there to break up the large flat surfaces. And I need to see it together with the small scale one. So yeah, I do it in that order and then go back and forth a lot. And I sometimes add some roughness and color to these breakup layers as well. It depends on the material. And so start with something that feels like too much and then adjust opacity and blending modes for each layer and each channel until it feels right. So roughness and height and color. Just play around with it until it looks uh, somewhat interesting. Oftentimes you need a lot less color and roughness breakup, for example, and the height channel can really carry itself here. The magic ingredient for this kind of semi-procedural texturing combined with a nice normal bake are, in my opinion, the curvature generator in edge or cavity mode, and then a blur slope node to break it up, to break those edges up and make it less even, and then lots of triplanar grunge maps using multiply or subtract blend modes to further eat into that perfect or semi-perfect mask. And in that way I can generate an effect that targets specific areas, like say the edges or crevices, procedurally, but I can modify them in such a way that they don't look even and boring. And because we are dealing with very geometrical hard surface shapes, and even our high poly has large flat areas, I'm using this way to add details to the surface and the mesh. For props sculpted with a lot of detail, we don't need to add so much breakup in the materials in Painter, because the bake normal already has a lot of mid and low frequency details. But for flat panels like these, I find it faster to add the detail in Painter procedurally rather than bringing my high poly into, say, ZBrush and then detail it by hand. And also this way I can reuse a lot of this uh, generator work that I put in. Then after this initial pass, I add some more definition and where, where I think it makes sense. So shipping crates don't usually get treated gently, so there should be signs of use. The edges and corners should have some chips and dents in them, where they got banged around. And they should be more glossy because they get handled a lot. And you can see that with certain plastic things. They essentially get polished by handling and rubbing against each other constantly. And those edges would be those that get the most contact. So I use those edge generators again for this that I used before. Dents into, that eat into the edges are very easy to make. Some chips. You add a fill layer with the height at a negative value. And then maybe some lowered roughness and the brighter color as well. But the magic really is in the mask. So you start with a rather contrasting edge generator. And then you add more grunges to subtract most of it. Probably about 99% of the white. You just subtract it, remove it. To just leave some spots, some white spots along the edges. And tweak this by eye a bit so it looks right also in the final version. Then add a contrasting grunge map to this and multiply or subtract essentially leaving only a few white spots along the edges in the mask. And this will make it look like chunks were broken off because the mesh will push in, the normal mop will push in there. And it looks quite cool and worn. It gives some nice uh, play with the light. And it's a similar strategy for adding scratches. Just uh, modify the mask, basically. Make sure you mask out the lower parts, the crevices, these kind of areas, because there would be no scratches in the recesses. You can also see me change the color of my material quite frequently throughout this process. I haven't decided yet what the final box will look like and I want these generators to work with a lot of different colors. So it helps me to see what each layer is actually doing 
by changing the base color a lot and sometimes turning it black to remove it entirely and just see what your roughness and height is doing, these kind of things. I'm always trying to save time and make uh, reusable materials. Yeah, so try and make them work with as many colors as possible and split up your effects into layers so you can get more control. Because certain things, uh, in, in certain colors, certain effects need to be stronger and certain others need to be weaker and it's nice to have that control later. And you don't need to redo everything or work your way through a very complicated layer stack. So name stuff properly and split it out how it makes sense. At this point I also added some general grime to the whole object and then just mask it with some generators again. And this general effect uh, helps tie everything together and really makes, uh, makes it all feel like it belongs together. When texturing a prop, it helps to start with the largest part first and work your way towards the details. And that gives you context for the small details and allows you to work with the broader strokes first and establish some general direction before refining. So now after the shell is roughly blocked in, uh, with that in mind, I move to the interior. I'm trying out a few patterns here of how the interior should look, because I did not add any details to the interior in the mesh, in the high poly mesh. And so everything needs to be done using the materials and painter. It's basically the same workflow as before. You start with the base material and then add some breakup through generators. Here I mostly focus on colors and roughness. And the height breakup really shines if you see your prop at like a glancing angle against a light source. So looking down, down your prop essentially. But of course, you will not get a lot of chances to see the interior of a box at glancing angles against the light because the, it would block the light, right? So spending a lot of time here uh, does not make that much sense on that. So instead, I'm trying to create a nice dust and dirt pass. Uh, that has a that will have a much higher impact, a visual impact later. And I will always jump uh, back and forth a bit between the materials, because everything is in context to each other, of course, and the result should appear consistent with each other. The metal and the lock areas are a bit simpler because they are much smaller, and I will use graphic elements here that uh, I want to grab the attention. They should, so I don't want to over detail them. If the area around them is roughened up too much, they will blend in and not stand out enough. But the basic breakup of those areas is the done with generators again here. Pretty straightforward. This is the first time I actually hand paint a mask for this prop, only to blur it to hell and eat into it with grunges again. So maybe this could have been done procedurally. Uh, this layer is used to brighten the main shell color in some spots and give that appearance of like some construction equipment you can see where you have a lot of wear on like some colored surface and some parts go down to the metal and all the color is gone, all the paint is scratched but some other parts they're just a bit roughed up and you can see that the color turns lighter like almost bleached or sun bleached like if you have some red excavator or something and you can see some almost pink areas in certain spots this kind of effect And I will use this same painter file, like substance painter file later as a starting point for the other props. And I don't know if I actually repaint this mask for them, but because there are a lot of generators after the paint layer, it almost doesn't matter what I paint in this mask. It just looks like noise. And because the material is masked in this, it will just distress like some random parts on the prop with a different UV layout. So try and catch that part later and uh, see if I do that and then decide for yourself if I should have repainted the mask or not. But anyways, uh, back, onto the, back onto the locks. I started to paint in some additional color to the dial here. Uh, this has to be hand painted because the geometry is just not there. And you can see the limitations of baking cylinders here, like I mentioned earlier. Around the outer circle, you get some part that should have been on the side on the flat of the base, but it's part of the dial itself. It doesn't bother me that much, especially here, but yeah, I admit it's not perfect. So if you have a better solution, please let me know. For the contrast in color, I picked an eye-catching yellow 
that are reused in the other designs to point out areas that require interaction by the people handling this kind of equipment. The painted mask again gets like a bunch of generators to break up the surface. I imagine some paint chipping off due to like rough handling or harsh environments and temperature shifts. So this is my mentality when uh, weathering these small areas. I return to the main shell here and add some additional weathering, some liquid stains on top, based on just a simple mask off the top, combined with the world normal and world position filters and some generators to limit the effect uh, to upward facing higher areas. It's a mostly procedural effect with uh, some rough initial mask painting uh, at its base. I use a similar workflow to add some dirt stains and drips on the surface. I make the different dirt effects different in color and roughness, and this will break up any type of surface and material color and makes them very flexible for a lot of different cases. And then I combine them afterwards and make them be rather sparing, makes a much more realistic appearance. Basically, I recommend to reduce the opacity of these kind of effects. Usually just a bit of each effect, but then adding multiple different ones will look much better than having just one strong one and give some impression of complexity when really we didn't do all that much here. And it's basically the same idea, just layered. And next here I add some dust from above and in the crevices, uh, but I really tone it down a lot. But it still helps a lot with the end result, just this subtle difference in roughness and color. And I also make sure to mask out areas that would not get that dusty, such as the inside of the box and the locking mechanisms. When making things look used in Painter, it is really easy to just let the generators do all the work. But you really have to think about why and how these things would get dirty and do get dirty. Which areas would be blocked by other parts, for example, or which areas would be cleaned by a person or, or by constant use? Imagine someone wiping the top, the top of this container, for example, or someone placing like their lunchbox on it and moving some dust around, or leaving a scratch mark or dent in like a corner or flat surface. In general, just imagine how this box would be handled by some cargo company crew or such. So now I am adding some additional custom weathering around the locks because I felt those areas needed a bit more. And those parts will be handled a lot and get a lot of uh, physical contact. And I imagine people would not always carefully try to match the top and bottom parts. So around these slots, the locking bolts I might scratch the other side a bit, something like this. Kind of how the lock on your door probably has a lot of little scratches from when you didn't hit the keyhole perfectly when trying to unlock. And wherever there's metal, there should be oil as well, which will then turn this nice dark brown, black, grimy color. And it's quite shiny as well. So I add some of that as well. And as a last step, I add some signs and some writing to the box. I use a simple fill layer with a positive height for the symbols on the box, and then a different one for the text. It has a color and roughness, and I add very little grunge to the mask to break it up a bit. And then I can export the masks and test them in the engine. In Godot, setup is straightforward. I add the GLTF files I exported earlier, and adjust the import settings a bit. Name the root, and change the type to static body. Then let Godot generate light map UVs for static light baking if you use that, and disable animation import. Then with that I make a new inherited scene and create the colliding volume. For this one I use a simple box. And you could also make a collider, a custom collider in Blender, but for simple things I usually stick to the primitives in Godot. It's pretty fast. And don't forget to change your collision layers if you need that, if you use that. Next is setting up the material. It's pretty straightforward, so I won't go into detail. And save the scene and continue with the bottom part.
And then I also make an additional scene here that has the box assembled. Because I imagine I will want to use that a lot later, so uh, it's good to have all three prepared. And already this one box gives me three props to place around the scene. And uh, here I have set up this little test scene before. It has the same lighting and environment effects that my outdoor level has. And it allows me to take a good look at how the assets will look in context and with the proper lighting and effects. And so I recommend to always check your stuff in multiple different setups, but especially in the conditions in which it will be used. So here I take a different test level and I make a little test scene with a few pieces that I can save out and reuse as well, like a staged set of props. And because I use light baking in my game, I baked the light maps in this small level and to get a feeling for what it would really look like in the end. I use this much smaller level because it's of course much faster to bake lighting than for the full size level itself. So that is the whole workflow for making a prop in Blender and texturing it in Substance Painter and then importing it into Godot. Of course this would work the same for other game engines which is the minor adjustments, usually just some simple settings. You can look this stuff up. So now with the process explained and the materials set up, it does not take much time to create a bunch of other assets, which is what I will do next. And just for some reference, making a text string this first crate took me a bit over a day of work. All the rest of the crates that I will show you in this video combined took another three and a half days, of course. So the process gets a lot faster once everything is set up. As the next prop, I wanted to make a little case that could go into the larger container. A bit like a pelican carrying case or something similar. That would then be stored in a larger crate to go on a plane or something, you know. So you can see me trying to apply the same design language to the smaller case. But as you can see in these examples, the result, I thought the deep extrusions that I had before don't work so well in this context. So I made them much more shallow and the case a bit more box-like. And on top of that, I want two sizes of case. One pretty much uh, two layers, double the height of the other one. I had to consider the size of the case and how many of those cases I would be able to fit in, a, in one of those crates I made earlier. And because of the way that those extrusions take up additional space, two single cases take up more space than one double height case, because it essentially, the center gets doubled up. And so because of that, I reduced the extrusion depth even more to make them more similar. Uh, which makes it easier to account for different combinations of those cases inside a box. So with that out of the way, I added the similar type of lock that I used on the big crate. And also a piece in the back of that case where it would open. Because this one, uh, I would imagine, would open with a hinged back. The final cases will not actually be able to open. So I'll only design the exterior. I also added some rubber pads to the outside because I imagine these cases are more fragile than the big crate and would have more sensitive equipment inside. And yeah, this is also the point where I realized that the big design didn't have carrying handles and also this one didn't. So I added a handle to this case but like I explained earlier, I decided against adding it to the big crate after the texturing and everything was already done. So until now, I only made the double height case because I have a neat trick for the single height one. After unwrapping UVs, I duplicated the mesh, which then had the same UVs, of course, and I just removed the bottom layer of the case, just this uh, segment, and moved up the bottom, this is now floating, to close the case again. 
So in this way, I can use the same UVs for both cases. And because the gap is in the crevice of that edge, it will be very difficult to spot that inconsistency in the final asset. So with both cases there, I just pack the UVs to make it easy for me to see uh, which UV island is used by which case. And it makes texturing a bit easier to know which part will only show up in the double, uh, double size one, double height one. For this one, the export worked a bit differently. I exported the GLTF, low poly versions, the same as before. So each case version gets its own file. But the OBJs for baking, they have both versions in a single file. So I can say, so I can texture them at the same time. If you end up using some hacky trick like what I did here, always test and make sure that it will not come back to bite you. And that's why I did it this way. So I can immediately see what both final versions will look like while working on them. And I won't um, have to change something after finishing one because it doesn't work on the other. Back in Painter, I start with a file of the crate that I worked with before. And first thing to do, of course, save it under a new name. And then configure the low poly, swap it out. And then in the texture baking, swap the high poly meshes, both for the ones of the case. And then, as I said before, do a test bake. And you can see that the test bake has some issues around the handle. And I will deal with this later by making some modifications to the low poly mesh and by adding a cage mesh for baking. To explain the process of baking normals a bit, the software that will bake the normals, in this case Substance Painter, will shoot a ray for each pixel in the texture map. So depending on your texture resolution at which you're baking. That ray originates without any other configuration. That ray originates at the position of the low poly mesh that that pixel on the UV represents. And then shoots it in the direction of the back of the face it originates from. So in negative normal direction, basically, until it hits the high poly mesh. So if it cannot find a mesh, uh, you might need to start further back. So imagine your high poly in some spots is a little bigger than the low poly. You might never hit that desired surface. So instead you can push the start of that ray back along the normal. And you can define how far that origin gets pushed back and also how far in it will go. So how long that ray is that gets cast in that mesh baking dialog. If you untick the use cage option, you can change those two numbers. And that's relative to the size of the mesh. So if you use one, it would basically move the origin, the size of the mesh back. And alternatively, you can use a cage mesh. A cage mesh is basically the low poly again. It tells the software from where it should start shooting the ray. So your cage always needs to be a larger version of your low poly mesh that is larger than the high poly mesh. So you would start at the low poly and shoot towards the high poly so that, of course, the cage needs to be bigger than the high poly mesh. And if the adjustments that I mentioned earlier in the menu won't fix your problems, then you have to use a cage. It's a bit annoying because you need to prepare an extra mesh, but it's worth the effort for clean normals and it generally doesn't take that long. Well, anyways, I won't do this now, but a bit later, because I didn't want to wait for a mesh baking. And so here I am just adjusting the materials from the crate to better fit the case. First I turn everything off and then I go layer by layer to adjust them. Of course, the painted masks need to be adjusted, but also the scale of some grunge maps. In Substance Painter, a scale of 1 for triplanar mapping, also UV mapping, means that the texture goes one time across the asset or the UV tile. 
So if the object is large, then the texture will be scaled larger. But if the prop is smaller, then that texture will be smaller. Just take up the same relative space, but not absolute space. So scale is relative. So if you go from a very large box to a very small one, you would get some result that doesn't match, it doesn't have the same scale. But luckily for me, by placing two cases next to each other, that scale uh, adds up to about the same as the scale of a single crate. And I don't need to adjust every single map. If my asset were much larger or smaller, I couldn't avoid it, though I'd have to adjust. After these first adjustments, I did a full bake, and you can really see the issue with the handle here. And again, I decided to postpone solving that issue and continue texturing for now, because I know I can solve this and it's not so difficult to do. And since I added rubber as a new material, I need to make a new mask and set the material up. And this is where I saw another issue with the handle. And this time it's with the UV layout. You can see it at, the, at those corners, at the edges of the handle. Because the edges of the rubber handle touch or even overlap the metal part, so the UVs of those areas, my materials overlap as well. And the only fix to that is to change the UVs, to have some gap there and get clean materials and corners from that. I will fix that along with a normal issue in a bit, but first I want to set things up. So I created the material for the rubber in the same way as the other materials. For the rubber, I wanted that used look where the main part of the rubber is quite rough and has some like yellow brownish dirt almost baked into it into the surface and the edges that get touched a lot should turn like very glossy and dark. So I'm sure you, you've seen this kind of look on some like old rubber parts before that get handled a lot. Next I had to adjust the bare metal material a bit because I now use it for a somewhat large area in the back of the case and it lacked detail because before it was only used on very small areas and what I had set up was fine there. And because it was a bit tricky for me to make the procedurals work for the large back and small front parts, I split the layers up and just masked out the mask them out by hand so I can control the wear separately. I thought that was easier and faster than to do everything procedurally. Like I try and go as far as possible procedurally, but if it's too cumbersome, I think it doesn't make sense to try and force it. So in the end, we get these nice scratches and dents in the large area and also those really nice smudges that you get when you touch some shiny part with really greasy, dirty fingers. It looks almost corroded, like this stark contrast in color and roughness. Of course, also the writing and decals need to be redone, but that's quite fast to do. And because I used a smaller bevel for the cases, the generators were too weak for this division line between the upper and lower shell pieces. So I added a hand-painted mask to emphasize the, where the case splits. And now with that set up, uh, let's go to fix the baking. So first I made a cage mesh by taking the low poly and moving all points along the normals just a bit. And that solved some issues, but now the front of the handle had artifacts. You can see these little black stripes. This happens because the high poly has an arch on that curve. And our ray casts now start from the cage, which is based on the low poly. So inside of the high poly, basically I should have compared the cage mesh here to the high poly, but I compared it to the low poly instead, if that makes sense. And their solution is simply to move those faces out until they are beyond the high poly, so those casts hit their target. And with the adjustments made, the bake looked much better now, and we have another asset finished. At this point, I started work on a shipping container for use with the boxes I made, a much larger asset. I was very satisfied with what I had done, but as these things go, 
you can imagine, I accidentally saved over my file and lost half a day's work. So instead of beating my head against the wall and doing it all over again, I shifted focus and instead started to work on a container to store liquids, like water or some other chemicals. I basically used the same workflow, so I will not go over everything here again, but there are some things to point out that might be interesting to watch. The main challenge in adding to the set that I already have now is matching the design language of what I created while still giving it a new twist, because you don't want to just repeat yourself over and over again and just add like a little spout, you know? So for this design, I wanted to convey the feeling that the canister has a thin plastic wall that is formed through some process similar to how like a large plastic jug would be made, like a plastic milk bottle or some oil canister. Those objects have this pretty distinct soft corner look the corners all have some radius, and if you have some flat areas, they should bulge a little. So mostly the flat surfaces are small or have some breakup, some ribbing to make them stronger, this kind of feeling. And in my design, I added this grid lattice that will be made of steel that will give additional structure and stability to the whole thing. Because really, if you think about it, this amount of liquid, it should have quite some mass and force to it as well because it's uh, almost a meter by a meter by a meter, which is quite heavy. It's, it's a ton, basically, a metric ton of weight. In the texturing step later, I decide to move away from this plastic look and more to a similar material as I used before. But that logic of deciding on the rounded shape still makes sense to me. Maybe you could argue that it doesn't make so much sense that the spout would be up at the top and not at the bottom. But I think there could just be a small pump and the convenience of using it up there would make up for the extra complexity of that. And anyways, in low or zero gravity, you can't count on gravity. You would need a pressurized container anyways. And otherwise no liquid would come out at all. So I think the way I did it is still fine. And I also added a small display up top to show how much liquid is left, or maybe if the pump battery ran out, or something similar. Or which kind of liquid it is, these kind of things. Or how long it's been in there. And because it would be quite bad to rupture the shell of the tank, and have the liquid leak, I was wondering how you would move them around. Because you can imagine some forklift or careless personnel accidentally damaging the container. That's why I ended up adding a metal pallet at the bottom of the container. When I prepared the low poly, I made a very unconspicuous mistake that took me a long time to figure out. It's a bit stupid, but I'll explain it. Because it might save you some time. I gave the whole asset some flat shading in Blender, and when I exported the octagon, for the spout, it had hard edges. In Painter, I tried to bake the normals so many times, and I always got a perfect cylinder with eight very visible hard notches in it. You will see it when I texture it later. And when I changed the shading of the low poly to smooth and re-exported it, all those issues were solved. But it took me a long time to figure this out. I didn't record it, but it was quite a long time. I tried to adjust the cage, all these kind of things, but yeah, it's uh, some simple. Sometimes it can be a simple thing like this. It gives you the most trouble, and even double checking all the meshes individually may not always point you in the right direction. So my, my tip for situations like this is to load all the relevant meshes into a new blend file really look at the topology and geometry data, the UVs, and see about the edge data, if they have sharpening, these kind of things. That should hopefully give you some hint uh, for a solution. And the other issue I ran into was when I unwrapped the cube 
that has the controls on it on the top where I added this little display. Because I let the interior flap of this uh, geometry unwrap kind of into the inside of that mesh piece into the hole that that mesh made, the edges of that touched where in the 3D mesh they don't. So when I bake the maps, I got artifacts there. To solve that, I ended up just scaling the bottom edge down, and which basically angles the sides a bit, but keeps the top continuous, which solved the issue, but it had another side effect as well. Because the edge of the UV island was now not parallel to the surface detail of the screen and the buttons, their edges have some stepping in them, in the textures. You can see this in the paint. I think for this it's acceptable, because uh, it's very small and you don't see it much, but I'll definitely not make this mistake again. So learn from my mistake and really think about how your faces will unwrap, and when you want to add some surface details in the materials later, like writing or decals, really think about this. And try not to cheap out on adding a cut when sometimes you might want to... Sometimes it might be worth to add an additional cut to get straight UVs. Maybe my saving grace in this case was that I gave those detailed areas already a higher uh, texture density. So it turned out less bad than it could have been if I had just uh, given all the islands equal spacing. So to explain a bit what I mean by that is, if you look at the checkered test view that I'm doing, that basically assigns this checker pattern to all the surfaces. And whenever the checker pattern is very large, that means the texture density is very low. Because imagine each tile is one pixel, so that means I have a lot less pixel to fill this area as opposed to some other parts like the spout, the tiles are very small, so I get a lot more pixels to add more detail in those area. That's what I mean with the texture density being not equal for the gray, for the whole asset. And another tip with this mesh I have is to see if there are any faces that you can delete in your low poly, because they will never be visible. Like for example, the bottom of that tank shell, which is touching the palette, that part you would never see. So you can just cut them out and get some more space on your texture sheet and also reduce polygon count. So here for the texturing, I reused and adjusted a lot of the previous materials again, but some of the parts needed additional work, of course. The buttons and the screen border, they got a new plastic type materials. It's quite simple, uh, pretty shiny, using similar methods I used before. And I used that yellow color again, and also some decals, to make the buttons look more realistic and give some variety to that area, more interest. And the bottom palette got a simple painted but heavily distressed rough steel material, rough metal material. For the screen that I have, the small screen, I wanted to evoke this feeling of like an old Casio calculator display that you had in school, this type. Some brown or greenish display with like a glossy finish and has a lot of dust and crud in the corners, like your classmate in math class, you know, this kind of feeling. So I spent the extra time to get a lot of nice smudges and wipes like dirty hands on it because I know I will probably reuse this material for other screens that I use on other assets so I think it's worth spending the time and I could even imagine making some shader a custom shader in the engine to add some yellow or green monospace type on the display that like the player can interact with or that will show some different things or you could even just mask it in here if you just need a static prop but for this, uh, 
a simple canister that may of course be a bit too much and not really have much additional function so i didn't do it yet i also use the same yellow as for the buttons to indicate other things that users would interact with so for example on the spout handle i made it yellow and then to finish i wanted to add some leaks where liquid would have left some stains on the container at that spout and I used a combination of hand-painted masks and leak textures, some general grunge maps, and also physics particles to achieve this effect. I layered a lot on top of each other. And the layer, the fill layer itself, is just a lighter color and some higher roughness. For leaks, generally, they seem very mad to me. Like on your shower glass, or like some dirty window, for example. It's usually some white, yellow-whitish color and a lot of madness. But I wouldn't hesitate to make them a bit glossy, for example, if the material itself is very matte. I believe that creating some good contrast is more important with these kind of effects than strict realism. The last set of assets I added were a gas canister and a carrier case for two of those canisters. For reference, I looked at how gas canisters get transported on trucks in the real world, and I tried to mimic that system for my design. With a rounded shape, it's more difficult to reference the beveled cube shape that I've used before. So I used the top and bottom of the canisters to evoke a similar feeling at least. Also, I was wondering how best to secure the gas canisters because I couldn't count on gravity to help me keep them in place in interstellar travel. So, because in the real world, they are usually just strapped in at the top and the bottom just sits there because they have a lot of weight. I also reused the pallet for the carrier. The carrier was textured using most of the same materials that I already made before, with uh, some small modifications to diversify the appearance of the metal brace, for example. It has this galvanized look to it that I added. And for the canisters themselves, I put a bit more effort in. I wanted a finish that is really battered and rough, but look very sturdy and strong as well. Since, well, they are gas canisters, after all, they should contain a lot of high-pressured gas and preferably not break easily. And in space with those temperature shifts there would be a lot of expansion and contraction of the gases as well and the material. And I also wanted them to contrast with the other finishes for the shipping containers that I made. So I made them a lot glossier as well. In the end, because I saw an opportunity to diversify a bit here, I ended up making three different color variations that can each work flip upside down as well. And this gives me almost six variations for a single asset, plus of course all the rotations. So then later I can combine these in different ways uh, with a carrier or without to get even more variations out of these assets. So after exporting everything and importing it to Godot, I was left with uh, quite a few new assets to add to my scene and test them. And I also made this plastic drink bottle and soda can, that, but I didn't record that. But it was done doing the same, using the same methods. After testing the assets, uh, I assembled some groups. So I assembled the gas canisters into a few different assembled modules and saved them out as separate scenes. And then of course have them separate as well. So this is what I ended up with, a handful of assets that can be used in, in multiple ways all over the world in my game and that are flexible enough uh, asset dressing for like almost every context. And additionally, I also established uh, some sense of a design language in the world that I can then build on in future props. For my game, 
the background is that a few large corporations own basically everything, all production, this kind of thing. So it makes sense for sets of things to share a common design language, but it still allows for some different themes because different uh, design groups or different companies would be responsible for different sets of objects. I hope you enjoyed the somewhat in-depth view into my process of thinking about the objects that make up the world of my game that I am designing and how I make them a reality, a digital reality, but still. I know it's a very long video and the process might seem labor intensive at times, but I hope you agree that the results are worth the time and they really look the part, I think at least. I am very satisfied uh, with the time investment and the results I gave I get for that. And if I can keep it up for the entire game, I think it should be very respectably looking at the end. If you have any questions or suggestions on how I could improve my workflow, please leave me a comment or just ask for some advice and I'll try and help you as much as possible. Thank you for watching and until next time.